You have an outline and some discussion questions, I believe, in your packet. When we think about eschatological hope, we need to think about how that relates to our contemporary culture. I'm going to show a clip here in a minute. I just want to set it up for you. Knocking on heaven's door. Perhaps eschatological hope in contemporary culture and church life is somewhat like the two primary characters we're going to see in the clip here in a minute. It comes from the 1997 German film Knocking on Heaven's Door. The song that Bob Dylan wrote in 1973 for the movie that you probably saw in a drive-in. Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. For those of us who remember. <laughs> drive-in movie theater, okay. This German film is described as a comic criminal film. Sounds intriguing. The two characters meet in a hospital and they both have terminal illness. They then set out on a journey to find meaning and love in their last days. Along the way, everyone they meet tells them that in heaven, which relates to our topic on eschatology, all people do is sit around and talk about how beautiful the ocean was. Well, neither of these men, who are in the prime of their life, probably late 20s, early 30s, just prime for seminary, <clears throat> decide that a bottle of vodka and some other things is the way they're going to find meaning and hope and love in life. I'm going to play this clip here for you. That song has special memory for me, Knocking on Heaven's Door. About 15 years ago, one of the most unusual types of funeral services I was asked to lead was introduced in a funeral home that was packed with about 200 people that you describe as probably hell's angels, people that were in leather and all that kind of paraphernalia. And they gathered there on a Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, 200 of them jammed in, every chair was taken in the funeral home. And the song that introduced me to lead the memorial service for this young man was Knocking on Heaven's Door. When I arrived at the funeral home, the funeral director was pacing in his office back and forth, ranting and raving. He said, it's just not right. It's just not right. Walking back and forth. And I said, what's not right? He said, it's just not right. I walked into the room and I said, oh, I understand why. You know, he probably wasn't used to a heavy metal kind of funeral. Guns and Roses version of Knocking on Heaven's Door. The reason this young man was there sitting in the vase on the podium was several days before that he was listening to some heavy metal music in his Camaro outside his family home where he's living with his parents. His mother came out and knocked on his door of his car and told him to turn the music down. This didn't agree with him very much. So he took his 357 Magnum pistol, which was right between the seats in the car, turned around and shot his mother at point blank range. Realizing what he had done, the only recourse he had was to take the gun, put it to his head and blow his brains out. Now, the part that he didn't realize that he didn't kill his mother. He merely blew part of her shoulder and arm off. She attended the funeral with her arm in a sling. That imagery of knocking on heaven's door, that song, and eschatological hope is what I tried to share that afternoon. I want to try and share with you some of those issues today. Eschatological hope for many people appears to be a search for reassurance that their soul or existence will continue after death. Easter and resurrection have become a ritual to reassure ourselves of the survival of the soul, while the ascension of Christ is not emphasized in the church calendar, or liturgy, or theology. Jesus' inauguration of the kingdom of God has become a debate over timelines for the millennium, 
Well, popular teaching on the resurrection focuses primarily upon the survival of the individual soul of the individual rather than creation being renewed. First, let's examine contemporary receptivity for teaching on eschatological hope and the meaning it may have for us as a Christian. My assumption is that the worldview of the Christian today in North America is primarily individualism. With a limited concern or teaching on eschatology in their church setting while trying to filter and understand a reasonable way to live in our contemporary culture. The Christian's exposure to eschatology might be limited to televangelists who focus, especially on Sunday evenings if you tune in, primarily on millennialism and charts. Perhaps eschatological hope can be rephrased in contemporary culture as knocking on heaven's door. To better understand contemporary culture and the meaning of eschatological hope, I will utilize some material from Henri Nouwen. And you'll see that in your outline there, the next step here. A nuclear perspective, modern slash postmodern. Nouwen puts them both together. Nouwen described a situation in what I call one of his thin, dangerous, classic monographs, The Wounded Healer. He describes contemporary modern or postmodern people who were born during the 20th century. That applies to most of us, right? During the 20th century, people experienced two major world wars, many smaller scale armed conflicts, nuclear war, where he, I think he gets the word nuclear from, and the threat of nuclear warfare along with an increase in violence within our society. There were also many positive quantum leaps in the 20th century in the advance of technology. But here comes the catch for nuclear humanity. The potential is that with this new scientific knowledge, we can create new lifestyles or eliminate ourselves. We can destroy ourselves with it. Now and then describes three issues for nuclear humanity that emerged from our culture in the 20th century. The first one is historical dislocation. Let's unpack that a bit. This is a lack of connection with cultural traditions, family, and <clears throat> life. Anxiety and joy give way to apathy and boredom. These are addressed in addictions. Life with a blurred identity lacks a connection to creation and creator. So what he's saying there in that first piece in historical dislocation that we are not connected. We're not connected to the past and the present and the future. We are basically here floating. The second thing is a fragmented ideology. There are no absolutes. Truth and reality are in the moment as defined by the individual. The quest here is for experiences that give nuclear humanity value and significance. Life is not shaped by an ideology, but by the people and experiences encountered on a daily basis. Do you ever ask yourself, why do people hang out at coffee shops? And why did my daughters, when growing up, and said, what are you going to do? We're just going to go out and hang. Now, you see, for me, hanging took me back to Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. <laughs> I just want to go out and hang this imagery of you know, Clint Eastwood hanging from an oak tree. We just want to go out and hang out. But we even abbreviate that. We're just going to go out and hang. That's a picture of what Nowen is trying to say. Number three, then, is the search for a new immortality. Is there life after death? This is not a relevant question for nuclear humanity. Is there life after birth is a more pertinent question for nuclear humanity. Left with nothing to hope for in this life, nuclear humanity is not searching for a happy ending or pie in the sky. 
That's why our movies, like we just saw here, that's how the movie ends. The scene goes dark. And if you've noticed that in literature, movies, that there is no happy ending. No more Dale and Roy Rogers riding off into the sunset. The theological concepts which N.T. Wright and Hans Schwartz have eloquently presented, heaven, hell, purgatory, resurrection, paradise, the kingdom of God, and life after death, do not hold any promise for nuclear humanity. When their present life lacks any promises, knocking on heaven's door is nuclear humanity's concern with getting out of life alive. Now, in response to these three ways of getting out of, sort of the sort of the morass that we're caught in, now it presents three ways that nuclear humanity tries to escape or try to survive. The first one is the mystical way. This is an inward journey or conversion. With addictive alcohol, drugs, Eastern religions, and transcendence to escape the web of personal reality that nuclear humanity has been spinning. The reality of the on-scene spiritual world is a dangerous exploration in occult, animism, and cyber experiences to escape the meaninglessness of their existence. And in the movie we see that portrayed. They're looking for a way out. And I think we all can see, can see there, that's why in postmodernity, Eastern religions, meditation, spirituality, now is seen as another viable option. Anything to get my mind and myself away from what I'm thinking on in my life's uh, crisis. The second way is revolution. This is the vision of a new world with a new humanity that is also a dangerous option. The options are not a choice between the present world and a better one. The choice for the revolutionary is between no world or a new world. This option expresses a conviction that revolution is better than suicide. This one takes some time to think about. It helps us maybe understand the appeal of radical movements, of militancy, whether it is <clears throat> within Christianity or Islam or any world religion, this concept of revolution. It's either a new world or no world. Terrorists, dictators, religious and geopolitical systems can be expressions of this perspective. Now, the last way here that Nowen presents as a Jesuit Christian is, and I'll quote him here, for a Christian, Jesus is the man in whom it has indeed become manifest that revolution and conversion cannot be separated in man's search for experiential transcendence. His appearance, that's Jesus, in our midst has made it undeniably clear that changing the human heart and changing human society are not separate tasks, but are as interconnected as the two beams of the cross. Nowen points us in the right direction. However, my critique of Nowen and much of contemporary eschatology is the lack of grounding in biblical theology and a clear understanding of the kingdom of God. <laughs> While I'm a huge fan of Nowen, many of you know that, because we use his text, in regard to his work in Christian spirituality and contemporary ministry, I have a lot of respect for him. But I think there's a need to expand and ground our eschatological hope in the king and his kingdom. I agree with Nowen that we need to be relevant in contemporary ministry and that self-disclosure of our healing wounds can speak volumes of genuine authenticity in ministry with nuclear humanity. My concern is the need for an objective biblical foundation that grounds the more subjective nature of being wounded healers in our contemporary modern and postmodern society. And in that context, we need a transformational reality of the risen Lord. In your text, 
N.T. Wright says on pages 121 to, 1, to 222, rather, 221 to 222, he echoes my concerns as he presents his paradigm that presents a holistic gospel. Here, Wright is presenting sound biblical theology of the kingdom and a practical application for our adventure in eschatological hope. I'm going to quote him here. The paradigm I have set out in this book tells heavily on both sides. This is the point. Where a genuine biblical theology can come out of the forest and startle both those who thought the Bible was irrelevant or dangerous for political ethics and those who thought that taking the Bible seriously meant being conservative politically as well as theologically. The truth is very different. As we should have guessed from Jesus' own preaching of the kingdom, not to mention his death as a would-be rebel king. His resurrection and the promise of God's new world that comes from it creates a program for change and offers to empower it. Those who believe the gospel have no choice but to follow. The new life in the spirit in obedience to the lordship of Jesus Christ should produce radical transformation of behavior in the present life. Anticipating the life to come even though we know we shall never be complete or whole until then. Insist on inaugurated eschatology on a radical transformation on the way we behave as a worldwide community. He's speaking about the church here. Anticipating the eventual time when God will be all in all, even though we agree that things won't be complete until then. There is the challenge. The resurrection of Jesus points us to it and gives us the energy for it. Let us overcome our surprise that such a hope should be set before us and go to the task with prayer and wisdom. I'm going to follow up on that quote from um, Schwartz. Where they're right. I'm going to go with a, I'm going to try to uh, frame this out for you here. Another missiologist and historian, Kenneth Scott LaTourette, had a seven volume history set for your leisure reading, probably over break or this summer sometime. You want to sit by the beach and read this. He wrote it over a period of years, and I'll give you the dates for these volumes. You can see how he was writing about a book a year, 37, 1937, 38, 39, 41, 43, 44, and 45. In his set, which I've read, that there is a theme that emerges out of it, and is coming to this as a historian at Yale, and is going to have to appeal to the ivory towers and try to explain the why of Christianity. And what he says there in his volume, and he just carries that theme and thread through his whole work, is that there is something about the resurrection of Christ that releases a spiritual energy that transforms the apostles and the people. And the, he can look at all the other factors which you've had in church history as to why we have this rapid expansion of Christianity. And if you really think about what we're saying here is that at the core of Christianity is a heartbeat a spiritual power, a core that is eschatological as we connect resurrection to that. Now a sidebar before we get into my final part here is you need to understand your speaker today. You can read the bio and that doesn't tell you everything. I suppose I should add this little part to that bio. But this was the framework that I was raised in. Along with the world wars and all the stuff that was going on, I was raised in South Central PA in two church plants. That frames me in a certain way. Another part of it is that we didn't have indoor plumbing. Now as Anabaptists, that wasn't a problem when it came to have time for baptisms because we didn't immerse because we didn't have indoor plumbing. There's some connection here, I'm sure, theologically. And so the deacon had to bring a gallon of water and a jug from home. We put it into a pitcher and then you were sprinkled at baptism. And usually a gallon was enough to take care of the candidates that morning for baptism. <laughs> well, 
I was also immersed in the theology that I'm sharing this morning. And this theological paradigm was described by an Anglican bishop from Durham, England, which we've read, N.T. Wright. This eschatological perspective talks about the kingdom of God as a proleptic reality in Jesus' incarnation and ministry. And this future kingdom is already revealed and accomplished, and we talk about this already yet not perspective that George Eldon Ladd made popular. His New Testament theology written in 1974 put it sort of on the front page for a lot of us as evangelicals. Jesus brought the kingdom in a new and more open way in his life and ministry, but it's not completed or consummated. Eschatological hope for Lad is expressed in vigilance in relation to the imminence of the kingdom's presence and consummation. So what I'm sharing with you today is at the core of my theology. It's what I was immersed and baptized in. It's not something that I'm presenting to you uh, because that's the focus or context of our uh, text. Perhaps we need to rephrase this question which I was assigned. The assignment was, what does eschatological hope mean for the Christian today? How about this for rephrasing? What does eschatological hope mean for the Christian who lives in a nuclear culture? As I began this morning, I wanted to create the tension from the movie and the music knocking on heaven's door and present with you, to you the concept of the culture and the context that we're working in, really it's global, not just in Western Christianity, about the modernity and the postmodernity that we're dealing with. That when you talk about eschatology, the response that we might find from people, and the people could be in the street, in the bar, and I see at the Stony Ledge is for sale, somebody wants to buy it, it'd be a wonderful ministry, wouldn't it? That <clears throat> The issue is, how are we going to translate this hope? When we talk about heaven, people in our culture are more concerned about life. They're not looking to the future, they're looking in the mirror. Hope that emerges from the eschaton began in a new dimension with the resurrection and ascension of Jesus the Messiah. And the birth of the church at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, an eschatological hope continues today. The apostles are the primary example of the impact of eschatological hope in the life of ancient humanity, who were caught in their own cocoon of tradition and web of culture with personal expectations regarding the Messiah to deliver Israel from Roman oppression and usher in the future age to come. In a similar way, we have to let go of our cocoon of tradition and web of culture in order to grasp eschatological hope. Wright and Schwartz have challenged our thinking regarding eschatological expectations. To summarize my reflections on eschatological hope, I'm aligning this presentation with three WTS curriculum markers, faith, hope, and love, and you can see those in your outline. In other words, in theological education, each course, program, and presentation needs to be based on faith. That's knowing. To increase our head's knowledge and understanding of God's word in order to have wisdom for skill, skillful and kingdom living. Hope. That's being. To increase our heart's capacity for vigilant vision and expectant certainty in the king and his reigning presence now and in the future and love. That's doing. To increase our hands grip on compassionate kingdom service. This threefold agenda of Jesus Messiah was utilized in his training of the twelve two thousand years ago and I believe it gives us the curriculum for our ministries today. The first point, faith. Repent and believe in the good news of the King. Jesus explains that eschatological hope is not only about the consummation of this age. In other words, the kingdom of God is not only in the future eschaton, it is already here. 
Jesus says in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. This brief declaration of the inauguration of the presence of the kingdom is foundational to understanding eschatological hope. In the Gospel according to Mark, he launches his treatise with a, I call it, a genesis of the good news about Jesus the Messiah when he writes, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ the Messiah, the Son of God. You find that in the beginning of Mark, in his intro. Similar to Moses crafting the Genesis account, he assumes the divinity and identity of Yahweh as creator and now in the fullness of time as the Messiah. Mark's approach is one of action-filled narrative rather than theological propositions or biographical explanations. Jesus is presented as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy with the agenda of the Messiah. I'll give you several reference points here to look at. We don't have time to read them. Isaiah 42, 1 to 9, and I'm going to summarize here, gives us a holistic change message of peace, justice, and missional light to the nations. My third point here from Old Testament prophecy is Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, is talking about cosmic change message of a new heavens and earth. And our last prophecy from the Old Testament is Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, is talking about personal change message of a transformed illumined hearts in the new covenant. I think those three big picture ideas present Old Testament eschatology that then is fulfilled in the new. What a powerful picture that's portrayed here by these Old Testament prophets. There's going to be a new covenant, there's going to be a new heavens, there's going to be a new earth. This is a picture of cosmic salvation where all of creation is renewed by the Spirit of God. The Apostle Paul also drives home this point when he presents Christ the Messiah as the summation or point of integration of all things in heaven and earth. We see that in Ephesians 1.10. Probably one of my key theological points in my whole journey has been the discovery of that picture there in Ephesians 1 uh, verse 10. The writer of Hebrews also begins his treatise with an emphasis upon Jesus as our great high priest, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the creator, sustainer of the cosmos, the revelator in these last days, and ascended Lord. You find that in Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. Repentance and belief are presented as the entrance point in one's faith journey to enter the kingdom now not at the end of the millennial age. After one has entered the kingdom, we strive and anticipate to bring the new order of the kingdom into this world. Schwartz cautions us here, and this is from page 407 in the text, but since his only anticipation, Christian faith is realistic enough to take into account our intrinsic alienation from God who is the source of all wisdom and all good things. Thus, we must reject the illusion that we could ever create a good humanity, a just society, or a new world. Unfortunately, the right understanding and true expectation that the new world will be brought about through God's own activity has often been used as an excuse to take the Christian attitude of active anticipation less seriously. I concur with Schwartz. If we take the good news of the kingdom seriously, what a difference the church can make in the world. Repentance is the U-turn to follow by faith in Jesus the Messiah and his kingdom agenda. <coughs> Reverend, <clears throat> sorry, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, which serves 16 million believers in 34,200 churches. And probably they planted one this morning, so probably it's increasing. While also being advocates for 42 million Hispanics in regards to socioeconomic and political empowerment. 
He has a prophetic message. I'm going to give it to you in very brief form, which relates to this issue. I heard his uh, longer version of this at a ACC conference in Nashville last year. He describes this, the agenda of the Lamb, which is an eschatological picture of how we live as Christians. These are his words. The obituary of American Christianity in the 21st century already permeates both church and society. Scholars and leaders from within and outside the church have arrived to the inevitable conclusion that Christianity in America will not survive the 21st century in a viable or sustainable manner. I'm going to pause here. Rodriguez says, I disagree. I agree with Rodriguez. I also disagree with that obituary. And the thing I want to emphasize here, it's because of eschatological hope. I'm going to continue now with his Agenda of the Lamb message. I believe the 21st century stands poised to experience the greatest transformation Christian movement in our history. This movement will affirm biblical orthodoxy, reform the culture, transform our political discourse, and usher in a new awakening. Yet this movement will be different from anything we've ever seen before. First, it will reconcile the agendas of Billy Graham and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Sidebar. He describes it that <clears throat> the movement he's talking about is you take Billy Graham, Martin Luther King Jr., and Sam Rodriguez, put them in a blender, add some salsa. <laughs> and that's what we're looking at is a new kind of reformation. Second, he says, it will activate the ethnic church as the proverbial firewall of righteousness and justice. Third, it will serve as the platform for an activist generation disconnected from the church but seeking to serve a cause greater than itself. For at the end of the day, this will not be a political campaign driven by expediency and agendas of man, but a prophetic movement driven by the impetus of the cross. What is the agenda for this new movement? It is not the agenda of the donkey or the agenda of the elephant. This movement stands driven by nothing other than the agenda of the Lamb. This is a good message for a political year, isn't it? The agenda of the Lamb stems from the facilitated platform of the cross. Jesus said, carry your cross and follow me daily. Matthew 16, 24. No other symbol incorporates passion and promise like the cross. A simple symbol depicting two pieces of wood, one vertical and the other horizontal, successfully branded the eternal hope of glory to all humankind. Madison Avenue and multi-million dollar campaigns have not been able to reproduce the loyalty, commitment, and even multi-generational allegiance to a message conveyed via the humble conduit of a brand, not written on the wood, but incarnated in the spirit of what it represents, grace and eternal life. That universal Christian symbol vociferously and with unbridled persuasion not only conveys a message of what is to come, but also what life truly is, a cross. The cross is both vertical and horizontal. Vertically, we stand connected to God, His kingdom, eternal life, spiritual truths, divine principles, and glory. Horizontally, to our left and to our right, we exist, surrounded and revealed through community, relationships, family, culture, and society. Simply stated, the cross is both vertical and horizontal, redemption and relationship, covenant and community, kingdom and society, righteousness and justice, salvation and transformation, ethos and pathos. John 3.16 and Luke 4. Internalized and transactional values. Billy Graham and Dr. Martin Luther King, faith and public policy, prayers and activism, sanctification and service, the New Jerusalem and Orange County, California. For far too long, people have <clears throat> lived either vertically or horizontally, but few, even in Christian leadership, have succeeded 
in living, speaking, equipping, leading, and ministering from both the vertical and horizontal planes of the cross. In order to fulfill the mandate of our Lord, in order to bring hope to a pathetic and hopeless time, we must stand and operate not from fringes either right or left, but from the center part of the cross, the strongest part of the cross, where the vertical and horizontal intersect, the center, the nexus of grace and hope. We need a church committed to saving the lost and transforming our communities, addressing sin and confronting injustice. It's not either or, it's both and. Historically, white evangelicals focused on two major issues, life and marriage. Meanwhile, ethnic Christians focused on the social justice elements of the gospel message from Luke 4 and Matthew 25, such as poverty, education, racism, and justice. The Lamb's agenda calls for the convergence of both the righteousness and justice imperative committed to life and poverty alleviation, salvation through Christ and the transformation of our communities, redemption and reformation, defending religious liberty and ending human trafficking pro-family, and commit to protecting God's creation. It is no longer either or, it's both and. The Lamb's agenda stands committed to a frame, to frame a narrative that reconciles both the vertical and horizontal elements of the cross, a platform of righteousness and justice. In other words, the Christian nexus of a kingdom culture ethos and a transmissional missional directive that is neither <clears throat> not either or, but both and. The place where conviction marries compassion, the fishes intersect with the bread, and truth joins hands with mercy. mercy. The next great transformational and prophetic movement in our nation must stand committed to the vertical and horizontal planes of the Christian cross. For via the agenda of the Lamb, as we approach the proverbial gate called beautiful, before us lies a crippled and paralyzed world begging for substance, begging for change. And from the center of the cross, we tell them, to those in the Barrio and Beverly Hills, to those in San Diego and, San and Seattle, we say, we may not have silver, we may not have gold, but what we have, we give on to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. That's a summary of his message. I think he's right on. And I'm sharing it with you because I think it's eschatological, but I also think it has something to do with you. I think the people that are going to do this transformation are sitting in this room. I think they're sitting in rooms all across North America and the West. I think the next generation of leaders are going to say, both and. In his book, Path of Miracles, Rodriguez states, God wants to be in our presence as much as, he, as we want to be in his presence. Knowing God, our faith is subjective and objective as a theological foundation for eschatological hope. Hope without faith is hype. The second point, hope. Proleptic, proleptic certainty in the king. Schwartz concludes his text by stating on page 407, knowing that the future has already begun in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It dares to anticipate proleptically this future along the avenue which the Christ event provides. Eschatological hope is central to our faith because it is intrinsically connected to the resurrection and salvation of humanity and the cosmos. Hope is not only clinging to prophetic promise of something to happen in the future, such as the survival of our souls. Rather, hope is being secure in the kingdom now and in the future, new heavens and earth under the Lamb's reign. Proleptic certainty is based upon our faith in Jesus the Messiah, the only Son of God who redeemed us and abides with us now by his spirit to encourage, comfort, illumine, 
renew, heal, guide, and empower with gifts for kingdom service. Proleptic certainty assumes the completion of a future event. There's your definition you were looking for, maybe. This isn't necessarily a household word, is it? <clears throat> we can reflect for a while on the concept of time as past, present, and future. And you realize that I'm running out of time, too. I have two pages to go. We'll make it here. In eschatological hope, I'm defining future as being present because it has already happened in the past as recorded in the New Testament. You can think about that for a while. I'll repeat that probably. We can reflect for a while on the concept of time as past, present, and future, and in eschatological hope, I am defining future as being present because it has already happened in the past as recorded in the New Testament writings. The Apostle Paul describes our crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and citizenship in heaven by means of our faith union in Christ in Ephesians 2.6, Philippians 3.20, and Romans 6 as having already happened. In other words, we're already there. Eschatological hope is augmented by reading, studying, and meditating on the Apostle John's Apocalypse. Jim Rezeke notes in his narrative commentary, The Revelation of John, that the author John has a tendency to present the results before the process, which is called hysterion proteron, last first, which is similar to my Pennsylvania Dutch syntax which this morning told Jakey to throw the cow over the fence some hay. <laughs> it makes sense. The quest for someone worthy to open the scroll is placed before breaking the seals in the apocalypse. The seals had to be broken before opening the scroll. But the more important item is placed first, the lamb, who reigns, who is worthy to open the scroll. This follows John's counterintuitive way of explaining that Jesus conquered death by his death on the cross. And you can read that in Revelation 5, this picture of the Lamb who reigns. Reski goes on to provide a paradigm for understanding the apocalypse as the new exodus of the new Israel, the church in its pilgrimage to a new promised land, the new Jerusalem. Like Israel, the church is in a wilderness, which is a place where the people of God dwell during the in-between times. Therefore, Christians view themselves as pilgrims, sojourners, resident aliens, citizens of an eschatological kingdom, dare we say kairos, time travelers, <laughs> who are homesick for Eden, but filled with proleptic certainty, hope in our risen reigning king. Hope is intrinsic to who we are as kingdom citizens. It is our identity, our core value, and our heart's vision. Hope is anticipatory by the nature of waiting for the present to catch up with the past because the future is already here. Sheen Claiborne explains another way. Here's another Amish proverb for you. The Amish are so far behind us as sojourners that we will never catch up to them. I come from Amish background and it seems I never do get caught up with the clock. One of our WTS graduates, Kelly Essinger, is teaching English in China today. Here is his latest newsletter. <clears throat> he shares insights that his family is gaining as they learn the Chinese language. And I just had to share this with you. Every uh, time I'm working on a presentation, you know how it is, everything you see has that theme. <clears throat> this morning, the paper in the editorial section, the theme is hope. I know nothing about a so-called bad economy. I mean, I won't even be looking for a job until I graduate with a social engineering degree, seven years from now. And he's wearing a shirt that says, hope is dope. And below that it says, why President Obama holds his rallies on college campuses. <laughs> now, 
Here's what Kelly writes from, and I'll post this over on the wall in the faculty pod. Here's his response, which is coming out from their work in China <clears throat> as they teach English to the local people. And as they're learning Chinese, now they're able to converse on a deeper level. As we engage in these conversations in Chinese, one of the prevailing themes is hope. I guess this is a global issue, isn't it? Students hope to get a good job after they graduate. People hope to make enough money to live a decent life. Parents hope their children pass the university entrance test and get into university. Single people hope to get married. Married couples hope to have a child. People hope to appease the spirits of their dead ancestors, and the list goes on and on. One of the things, and I'll, I'll just stop with this, I'll just one last thought here from Kelly. One of the things that breaks our hearts is that the vast majority of those living here either have no hope or are putting their hope in the wrong things. I think that not only applies to China, but I think it applies to the status you need us. And the point is I'm trying to get here on what hope is not what I desire or want. I think we use that verb in our language in the wrong way. For me, our theological understanding of hope is that is proleptic certainty in terms of it has a foundation in our faith and changes our heart and being. My last point here, love, compassionate service with the king. Jesus proclaimed or preached the good news, the gospel, that is defined as the arrival of the kingdom of God. Specifically, Mark proceeds to describe throughout his gospel the agenda of the Messiah in the person, life, teaching, and ministry of Jesus. The presence of the kingdom in ministry was explained by Jesus in Luke 17, 20 to 21, as already being here. Anabaptist theologian Thomas Finger has written a systematic theology based on eschatology. It's called a contemporary Anabaptist theology. He moves eschatology from being the last loci to becoming the first loci and the core fabric of his theological weavings. Intriguing. I've had many long discussions with him about this. Intriguing character. Finger states that Menno Simon's primary theme was that the new creation has a future dimension, but that it has already come. The concrete implication, repent immediately and rise with Christ to new life. The heart of Menno's eschatology and ethics was that the new creation would sometime in the future pervade everything, but is already here. Therefore, it was fully possible, possible to live by Jesus' ethics and undertake his mission. The ethics and mission of Jesus need not wait until society becomes more hospitable to such idealism. This lifestyle must be adopted not simply because Jesus taught and exemplified it, but because through grace the eschaton was present in a way that made it attainable. Here are my concluding thoughts on this. The Christian alternative and spirituality, worship, and community are vital connections that the church needs to be engaged with in order to be relevant in our missional context, context and quest. Too often the church has lacked integration of social justice, peace, and evangelism. Justice without peace and evangelism is socialism. Peace without justice and evangelism is political activism. Evangelism without peace and justice is conversionism. My last video clip. Ray Anderson also turns the theological tables upside down in our seminary temples as he asserts his theological thesis in his monograph, The Shape of Practical Theology. Ministry, Anderson says, is determined by God's own ministry of revelation and reconciliation in the world, beginning with Israel and culminating in Jesus Christ and the church. Thus God's ministry becomes the dogma from which all insight into the nature and strategy of ministry issues and to which the church must return in every generation to test its own concept of ministry. Christ's primary ministry is to the Father for the sake of the world, not to the world for the sake of the Father. This means that the world does not set the agenda for ministry, but the Father who loves the world seeks its good and sets this agenda. 
here is your conclusion as you're going to make it before lunch. Kudos to you, you didn't fall over in the process here, cave in. Three implications, I believe, as we land this plane. Ministry today in nuclear humanity and society. First, eschological hope. It is not wishful thinking for foolish Christians, but it is proleptic certainty that life has purpose and meaning in the kingdom now. The good news is holistic in addressing the need for conversion to be connected to creation and the creator in the midst of a kingdom community. Instead of addicted, apathetic lifestyles, there is a need for a new freedom and identity in Christ. Second, eschological hope is not based upon meeting our personal political wants and economic desires, but it is grounded in faith based upon a biblical theology focused upon the agenda of the Lamb. Third, eschological hope is not only concerned about the future survival of the soul with the ground of faith and perspective of hope, Nuclear humanity can be equipped and ready to grasp the gospel plow of compassionate service with the king. Eschological hope is the epileptic certainty now of the new heavens and new earth with the new people of God in the new Jerusalem surrounding and serving the Lamb who reigns now and forevermore. Amen.